Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm pastor and teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 11. Now, before we begin, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and at the same time give ourselves over to the Holy Spirit, and that way we get the most out of our study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege, the freedom, and everything you have provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. In verses 11 through 14, Augur, remember he's the one who wrote these sayings, inspired sayings of God's word. He speaks of four evil things. The first thing he speaks about is disrespect for parents. Listen carefully, children. Verse 11 reads, There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. Now, the idea of those is a group. There are some young people, some people, who curse their fathers. To curse means to dishonor them, to uh, despise them, you look down upon them. It's a pretty powerful word because basically it means you turn on your parents' authority. You revile them is another word. On the other side of that, and do not bless their mothers. So these are both negatives. They don't bless their mothers, but, but they curse their fathers. So these are both bad things, but both parents are basically cursed rather than being blessed. To bless means to uh, ask God's blessing upon your parents. This is what this is about. So there are those, there are children who do not bless their parents. That's a bad thing, a really bad thing. We should be blessing our parents through prayer, honoring them by caring for them, loving them, and never curse them. Now, remember, they lived under the Old Testament law when Proverbs was written. So it was a powerful thing if you cursed your parents, and that could bring the most severe penalty, even death. Listen to Exodus 21:17. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Now, how do you curse your father or mother? Well, you lie about them. You slander. You wish bad things upon them. Really evil bad things. Well, that can come back on you if you were to do that. And then for those who do curse them, there's a curse on them. So the children that would curse their parents, they actually get a curse. Deuteronomy 27, 16. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother. And all the people say, Amen. In other words, the people agreed. It's a bad thing to do. You see, when you curse your parents, you're cursing God's institution, the thing that he set up to uh, begin families, to raise families to uh, take care of children, to populate the earth, to continue the human race. God has a purpose for human beings, and he has uh, creatures called human beings that are to have families, and it's very important that the children respect the authority of their parents. Now, we've studied a lot of Proverbs about rebellious children, if you want to make a list, I'll give you a, a list. Uh, you can write this down. I can put it on the board and you can look at it. Uh, let's see here. Let's do it this way. Proverbs 10, 5, 13, 1, 15, 5, 19, 26, 23, 22, 28, 7, and 24. 
And we've also studied a number of proverbs that tell us that if a child is wise, it can bring joy to his parents. If he's a fool, it can bring sorrow. We have a list of those as well. I'm just going to put Proverbs up here. Uh, Proverbs 10, 1, 15, 20, they're all from Proverbs. 17, 21, and 25, 23, 15, and 16, 24, 25, 27, 11, and 29, 3. You see, when one speaks down upon this divine institution, what God has set up, like parents and children, he should expect judgment. Another verse on judgment for those who curse their parents, Proverbs 20.20 20 reads, we studied this in a while back, the one who curses his father and his mother, his lamp will be extinguished in pitch darkness. That's a way of saying he'll die. He'll die. The, the lamp uh, gives light. The light represents your life. It'll go dark. Verse 12 changes the subject a little bit. Sometimes these subjects change, but they kind of overlap too. So a child can be self-righteous. He can think he's better than his parents. And the next one talks about self-righteousness. We'll explain that. Let's read it. There are those who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their filthiness. A self-righteous person thinks he's always right. He thinks he's above others. He thinks he's pure. He's, he doesn't sin. He often has his own, what he would call morality, what he thinks is right and wrong, not according to the scripture, but what he wants to say is right or wrong. He may say it's okay to, to steal if someone has a whole lot of money and you don't have very much. Well, let's, let's make us even. No, that's not right. Or to say bad things about people to slander them, to malign them, to lie about them. He says, yeah, but they're crummy people. No, you still don't do that. You still don't slander them. Self-righteous people are often hypocritical as well. They're doing the wrong things they accuse others of doing. Look at the next line. And yet are not washed from their filthiness. Now, this is like the worst word you can think of when it comes to defining filthiness, okay? Uh, I'll tell you what it means. It means poop. It's like they're in poop. We see it that way in Deuteronomy 23, 14, Ezekiel 4, 12. Now, the more uh, proper name is human excrement. Have you ever heard that term? That's what poop is. Scripture is very clear that self-righteousness is filthy. Why is it described that way? Because people who are self-righteous, who do uh, self-righteous works, they think their works are as good as God's. In other words, they put themselves up on the same level as God. And what this second line tells us is that their works and their own energy, what they think is right, is actually most filthy. Because people who have this attitude think they're like God. Now, the only way to get cleansed of this is to turn to God and confess your sin in repentance. You see, self-righteous people attempt to make their own efforts, what they do, their opinions, on the level of God. But this is human good. Now, we've talked about this, uh, if you've been with me on some of the lessons. Uh, when we are controlled by the Spirit, okay, let's just say uh, we're controlled by the Spirit, all right, on the board. Controlled by the Spirit. We're obeying the Word, okay, you're obeying the Word. and you're obedient and you do something, then you do a good work. All right? But when you're controlled 
by the flesh, that's the sin nature, okay, and you may think you're obeying the word, but you're just basically doing something that you think is right, okay? So we're going to say you think it's obedience, and it's really not. Then you're doing a human work. Okay? Uh, let's suppose you have somebody who decides they don't want to work. And so they don't eat very well. They don't take care of themselves and they get sick and they're miserable. And you decide, well, you're gonna take care of them. You say, well, yeah, but they should be working. But you decide you're gonna take care of them. How do you know that's God's will? How do you know it's not God's will for them to suffer until they start waking up and working for a living? Quit being a fool, all right? So human good is no good. It's worthless, all right? We're going to just put down here, it's filth. Okay? Uh, God doesn't pull any punches when, it des when he describes people's human works because they're no good. This is what religious people do, people who don't really understand what it means to live by the power of the Holy Spirit or be obedient to the word. They make up their own rules and regulations. The people down here are hypocrites. Okay, often they're very religious. When I say religious, I don't mean in the good sense. I mean they set up what they think is right and wrong and they say this is what God must believe because I believe it. They got it backwards. Okay, when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, they were the big religious leaders, okay, in his day. Pharisees and the Sadducees and people like that. And he spoke to them rather sternly, rather strongly. Listen to this. I'll read a couple of verses from the Gospels where Jesus is talking to these Pharisees. Luke 16, 15. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men. Notice. They justify themselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men, what is lifted up among men, is an abomination in the sight of God. There are many things that people admire in other people that are an abomination. You may be a very, someone may be very wealthy, and have a business empire, and people say, wow, he's great, he made this empire. But he may have got it by being mean and crooked and took, took advantage of people, things like that. John 8, 44, another one where Jesus addresses the Pharisees. You Listen to this, and this is a tough one. You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. That father would be the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand or uphold in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and father of lies. What this says at the end is all he can do is lie. He's always deceiving. He's always lying. And Jesus was calling the religious leaders, uh, basically children of the devil, In verse 13, it speaks of their pride. There are those whose eyes are so lofty and whose eyelids are lifted up. Now, this idea of the eyes being lifted up, uh, that indicates arrogance. You know, like somebody, you know, they're just, well, we use the phrase hootie tooty. They kind of just lift their eyes and, and they look up and they, they, well, I'm just better than you, da, da, da. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. And this shows that the uh, wise person who wrote this, Augur, wrote these things. He's telling us that this is how they show their arrogance, how proud they are, and yet they're in such a sorry condition. It indicates, when they lift their eyes, it indicates their contempt for others. In other words, they're not going to look down on you. I mean, all they can do is look down on you, so they're going to look up. 
and they look away from you because you're just too low, you see. They view themselves as above God's truth and exalted over others. There are entire people like that in the Old Testament we can read about. Uh, the Moabites, for example. We read about them from Jeremiah 48, 29. Listen to the description. We have heard of the pride of, the, of Moab. He is very proud of his loftiness, his pride and his arrogance, and the haughtiness of his heart. Haughtiness is a way of saying the, the arrogance of his heart. Sometimes singular verbs or singular pronouns will be used for someone like a tribe. He is very proud or it is very proud. The Antichrist, who may be here soon, listen to how Daniel speaks of him in Daniel eleven thirty six. This is the Antichrist. Then the king, that's the Antichrist, will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak extraordinary things against the god of gods. Now, this is in Old Testament terms, so when you say they're above every god, remember, many people believed in many gods in those days. And this is a way for Daniel to communicate to his audience that he's, he's going to claim to be above all your gods. All right? He's going to claim to be the god of the gods. And notice what it says here uh, in the middle of the verse. He will, uh, and will speak extraordinary things against the God of gods. In other words, the God, the creator God, the God of Israel, he will speak against him who is over all these other so-called gods. And he will exceed until the indignation is finished for what is decreed will be done. This is basically saying he'll... he'll uh, do what he's supposed to do in God's plan until that is over with, and then he's done. He's done with. But the point is, he's arrogant. He's arrogant. In verse 14, we learn how the arrogant people oppress the poor. There are those whose teeth are like swords and whose jaw teeth are like knives to devour the poor from the earth and the needy from among mankind. Now, this one may surprise you, but let's pick it apart a little bit. We have what we call figures of speech or metaphors, where their teeth are described like swords. Notice this, swords and knives. Why? So they can eat up people, devour the poor from the earth, and the needy from among mankind. In other words, they will use their mouths. That is symbolic. Their teeth are symbolic of their speech. And they will eat people up. They will run them down. They will lie. They will deceive. They'll take them to court and abuse them to try to get rid of them. Now, listen. Just because they're poor or they're needy doesn't mean they're bad at all. In fact, they could be believers. Often, when believers live under tyrannical rulers, that is, tyrants, arrogant, um, bully rulers, they will prevent them from making a decent living, and they'll be poor, and they'll be needy, and they'll be sick, and they will live in the worst part of town, the dangerous part of town. And these arrogant people want to get rid of them. Say, well, they're no good. Well, you made them, you helped make them no good by not letting them make a decent living or keep a job or buy food, that type of thing. So they want them destroyed. Now, don't forget that. When things get really bad and rulers get really bad, they will want to get rid of the poor and the needy, and often that's including believers. Because, see, these crooked bully leaders will do things to believers that believers will not do back. Believers just try to survive. They may move. They may have to leave if they can. 
But if they can't, and it's God's will for them to be there, maybe to minister to the other poor and needy, then it'll be rough on them, really rough on them. But don't miss the point. They want to devour them. They want to destroy them. They want them removed from the earth and from mankind. They want them off the planet. David realized how bad Saul was getting towards him. And he wrote a psalm. Listen to what he wrote when talking about King Saul and those who are pursuing him. My life is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid amid fiery beasts. It's like everywhere I go, even when I lay down to, to sleep, I'm surrounded by enemies who want to eat me up. He goes on, the sons of man whose teeth are spears and arrows. In other words, people who run me down, whose tongues are sharp swords. So basically he's saying a lot of the same stuff we just read in this proverb. You see? David speaks more of godless and evil people. Way back in 14.4, listen to this one. Don't all these, this is Psalm 14.4, excuse me. Don't all these evildoers know anything? Those who devour my people like they eat bread. Those who do not call upon the Lord. Notice, do not call upon the Lord. So these are arrogant oppressors who will go after faithful believers. They'll try to take their property, their livelihood, withhold their wages, attack their families, do whatever they can do to crush them. This is what bully leaders do. We call them tyrants. In verses 15 and 16, we speak of insatiable things. Now, what's insatiable mean? Insatiable means you can never be satisfied. You can never have enough. It's like someone who cannot cannot stop eating. Or maybe someone who's an alcoholic and they can't stop drinking alcoholic beverages. Someone who can't have enough of this or that, whatever it may be. Can't have enough money, can't have enough cars, can't have enough uh, uh, people who follow them, so they're always trying, trying to get people to approve of them. It's insatiable. Listen to the way it's put. It's interesting. The leech, you know what a leech is, right? It's one of those little, uh, well, you usually find them in swamps. They attach themselves to the skin and suck blood until they're full and bloated. And I suppose after they're bloated, they might... Uh, just hang on until they want more. And, and you may have seen movies where they'll come out of a swamp, they have leeches on them, and they'll get them off of them. But anyway, they want more and more. So the leech has two daughters. Now remember, this is poetry. Give and give. That's the name of the daughters. Isn't that funny? There are three things that will never be satisfied, four that have never said enough. Now this is a Hebrew expression to just to introduce something that's coming up here. There are three things that uh, are never, that will never have enough. There are actually four, and they never say enough. So they put it in two different ways to, to make the point that there are four things now that never are satisfied. Okay, now he'll divide these things into two pairs. So don't miss this. Uh, they never have enough to say enough or just stop. I've got all I want. They never say that. Here we go. Sheol and the barren womb, earth that is never satisfied with water, and fire that never says says enough. Now, let's talk about these. Sheol is another name for the grave or death. The barren womb is a woman who hasn't had children, but she really, really wants them. So what this is saying is there's never enough people dying to satisfy death. Uh, You think about it. People are always dying. Things are always dying. Sheol is never happy. Never can say enough. 
On the other hand, on the other end, is the barren womb. A barren womb calls out for uh, to have, it wants to have things born. A woman who wants a child needs the seed that will uh, work with her egg, let's put it simple, and she'll bear a child. But a barren womb is never happy. They always want more. And that's the idea here. So what this does is it takes us from, well, if you start on the right side, from the barren womb, from birth to death. Never enough birth, never enough death. And then it goes to the earth. Earth never has enough water. Remember, the, uh, the earth needs water all the time. Uh, not constantly, but regularly. If you don't have water, we don't grow plants. There's no life, so you see the connection to life. And fire, you see the connection to death. Fire never says enough. Fire just keeps burning and burning. It's always wanting something else to burn. Something that's uh, combustible, as we say. It's a big, long word. It means basically something that's always burnable. Okay, wood, paper, anything that burns. Fire won't stop until it burns up everything, unless you use, guess what, some water right? Or today they use some sort of chemical. But this is just talking about insatiability. Now what's the point? Well, it's setting us up. Uh, people who never have enough, uh, they get themselves in trouble. We use words like greed. They want more money. They want more property. They want more, uh, well, let's say food. They want more fine drinks. They want all the fancy stuff. They want more money, fame, approbation, power. Tyrants seek to destroy like fire. They want more and more power. On the other hand, righteous people seek to give life. Okay? And they want to see righteousness increase upon the earth. Don't we want to see more people doing things right? Of course we do. So we seek more righteousness. So what this is saying is insatiability is part of life. But for the righteous, in certain areas of our lives, we are to control ourselves, control what we want, control what we need. Now, that's kind of a lesson that may be hard to see here, but the point is there's a lot of insatiability, and that's really natural in many ways. It's natural. It's natural for fire to keep burning. It's not always good, is it? But uh, it's natural. Verse 17, we return to the child, the disrespectful child. So here we go again. Verse 17 reads, The eye that mocks at a father and despises obeying a mother. Now, we're talking about the eye here. Remember that. The eye that mocks at the father and despises obeying the mother. The ravens of the valley will peck it out. The it is the eye. Okay? And the young vultures will eat it. So, the eye that mocks the father, runs down the father, scoffs at a father, that would be disobeying, okay? And then, and despises the eye that is a manifestation of a child, how he sees things. He doesn't want to obey his mother. By the way, this word for obeying in the Hebrew could possibly mean something else. Sometimes when the old fellows would would copy down uh, the scriptures because they didn't have printing presses. They just hand copied. They might mess a letter or two or their eye might skip a, skip a line or something. They jump to the next line. This word also, if you look at some of the copies, it says like gray hair. That's right, a word that means gray hair. So you'll have different translations. Most people will take it as obeying. But if it was gray hair, it would mean he despises his mother as she's old. We use the word aged. 
he despises aged mother. But the point is, this child looks down upon his father, looks down upon his mother, and what's his penalty? He gets a penalty. Here's his curse. The ravens of the valley, this pictures the natural process of judgment will peck his eye out and the young vultures will eat it. So the birds will come in, uh, the heavenly birds, right? Birds from up high, from sky, probably representing God's judgment in that way. It's quite a way to represent it, isn't it? Isn't it interesting, though, you have to think about this, to, and it helps you learn it when you have to think it through. If I was just to say, don't run your parents down or you're going to be judged, that's one way to say it. Not very colorful, is it? But when you put it in these poetic terms like this, you think about them. And you think about, wow, imagine having your eye pecked out by a bird then having a bunch of other birds come over and eating it. And when you start to picture that in your mind, you get to give a little more, what should we say? Uh, we go from black and white to color. <laughs> it's more colorful. Verses 18 and 19 gives us four wonders of nature. Now, what are wonders? Wonders are things that, well, they're wonderful to look at. They're uh, amusing. It makes you think. Okay. Now, verses 18 and 19 are four wonders of nature. And we begin again with those, one of those introductory lines we saw a while back. Listen to this one. There are three things that are too wonderful for me, four that I do not understand. So again, that's the introductory line. When he says too wonderful, there, these are things that he cannot completely figure out. Why are they that way? Then he gives some good examples. These are kind of fun too. The way of the eagle in the sky. The way of a snake on a rock. The way of a ship and the heart of the sea. The way of a man with a virgin. Now let's talk about these. When I was in California years ago, when I was a young man and in the military, we would go out and we would train in the mountains and sometimes they'd have a sit down and we'd uh, have instruction or maybe we were just resting. And you could look back and look over the mountains and you see eagles flying way up high. I mean, really up high. You know, just not like through your backyard. But they were so far off. But they're big birds. And they would just float across the air streams and uh, as, as if there was no gravity. They wouldn't even have to flap their wings, maybe now and then, but they would often just float across the air like that. And it was wonderful to see. The next one here, the way of a snake on a rock. Now, what does this mean? Well, have you ever seen a snake crawl across a rock? Now, we know that they have scales that actually move, that'll move them across. But think of it. They really don't have any legs or feet. But they move just as natural and normal across a rock. There's no ladder there, no steps. But they can climb a rock. Uh, and they can crawl across a uh, rocks and never you know get tired necessarily the point is it's fascinating to watch them how they just roll around go left and right and back and forth and can lift up and go back down there's something to watch i suppose that's one reason people watch them at the zoos just to see them move another Wonder, wonderful thing, a wonder a thing that we wonder at is the way of a ship and the heart of the sea. This means a ship way out in the water, way, way out in the ocean, for example. I've been out in many ships in my life, uh, some of them very big, 
and you go out there and you stand out on deck and you can see as far as you can see is all you can see is water the water do it at night during the daytime of course at night you can't see much unless there's moonlight and that's fascinating as well and yet a ship just goes about its way. Now in those days they had sailing ships and uh, uh, the wind would carry them along and to the water until they, well, they may go out of sight. Or they may be coming in and they'd be coming straight at you. And how do they move? They move by the wind, they move by the waves. And it's a wonderful thing to watch. They're so quiet, I used to go out to the beach uh, when I lived near uh, the uh, Pacific Ocean in, in California, and uh, they had this festival where ships, sailing ships, would come in from around the world, some of them quite huge, several masked, um, with a lot of people. And they're made of wood, and they'd come in, and they were so quiet because they didn't have any motors. They'd come in by the wind, you see. And it's wonderful to see this huge ship move across the water with just the wind. So these are more wonders. The last one, and the way of a man with a virgin. This is the way, there's a couple of ways one can take this, but uh, we'll explain the one where a man is courting a young woman. A young man finds a woman he, lo he wants to love and have, and she wants him. And the way he courts her and, and uh, honors her and she responds to him and trusts him. She builds up her trust and respect for him and he begins to love her. This is a marvelous thing to watch. It's even greater to experience it if you ever have. As you get older, you, you do that and it's a wonderful thing to look forward to and do it right, you see, do it right. That's another wonder that God has put on this earth, a natural thing for us to experience or watch as we see these animals or watch a ship. Well, that is the right way to do things. A man with a virgin, that's the idea. She's a young maiden. She's not sleeping around with a bunch of men, if you know what I mean. Verse 20, well, we go the opposite route. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She has eaten and wiped her mouth and has said, I have not done wrong. Now let me explain. Parents, this is for, I'll try to be careful. Adulterous woman is a woman who not, does not stay faithful to her husband. Okay? And she will tempt a man or a man will pursue her because he wants to have a, a sex with her. And she will have sex with a lot of men. She's not faithful like the woman we just saw above. A man with a virgin, one man, one woman. She'll have lots of men. And of course, this is sinful. This is a violation even of the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments. So she has many partners. And here's what this means when it says she has eaten and wiped her mouth. She does that without even thinking of it. It's like, well, it's just eaten. I can wipe my mouth. I'm all clean. It's all good. So she does it without any sense of guilt and continues to do it. And she says, I have done nothing wrong. So she thinks no more of having all these sex partners than just wiping food from her mouth. No big deal to her. That's crazy, isn't it? But what she, was, what she has done, she has attacked one of God's divine institutions of the moral order and ruins it for her. For the many men she has uh, done this act with and destroyed marriages. And when you destroy marriage, you destroy society. You destroy trust among people. But for her, it's just like taking another bite of food. That's how messed up she is. Now, in the next three verses, we see four things that turn 
uh, the social order on its head. Now, the social order is basically how we're to get along in society. It turns it upside down. Now, this is an interesting one, too. It makes you think, though. Here we have one of those introductory lines, verse 21. Under three things, the earth shakes. And under four things, it cannot endure. So what this is saying is, there are four things that just are upside down on the earth. It doesn't seem right. Okay? We would say, well, that's not right. That's not normal. That's against what, uh, against the way things usually go. We don't expect it. In fact, it's opposite of the way things should be. Okay? So one of the lessons here is that we recognize when things are not right. We have enough moral sense to know when that's not right. Something's happened to make that backwards or wrong. Okay? Now, you see the word under. We'll see the word under in the next two verses. So this is connecting it back to things that happen on the earth. Under the earth is where the earthquake forms, you know, the crust collapses or shifts or something like that. And that's the idea. So we continue with the word under here. And here's some of the things that happen on the earth that are backwards. Under a slave who becomes king. This is like saying someone who's a slave is suddenly made king. How does that happen? Slaves just don't become kings. They're used to being told what to do, not tell people what to do. If you think about it, a slave can't be a good king. He doesn't know how. He's never been trained on how to rule, how to administer, how to make important decisions, how to delegate authority. These are things that kings are often trained to be when they're raised in a dynasty. When a responsible father will train a son how to take his place. But a slave has no skills. He has no father who is a ruler or a king. He doesn't know how to rule a nation. He will more likely ruin a nation. So the point is, on earth, a slave would be completely out of place being a king. Now the word can also mean servant. The word for slave he could be an official under a king. Now you think, well, he'd know more about being a king since he worked closer to the king. But he wouldn't be qualified either, uh, especially if you think about how would he become king. Often it was the officials who liked to overthrow kings and take their place. And when they disrespected authority like that, what makes you think they'll respect authority when they become a king? So he's even worse. He's power hungry. He wants uh, a promotion without earning it or deserving it. And he'll become a tyrant. Often they become selfish, undisciplined tyrants. Remember, a tyrant is like a bully. People often think of Hitler as one of the worst tyrants. And many other rulers in history, if you've studied world history, there have been many who have been tyrants. The next one, under a fool who becomes satisfied with food. Now, we've studied a fool many times in Proverbs. The Bible has a lot to say about a fool, especially in the Proverbs. The wise person is the opposite of a fool. Okay? A wise person makes a living, makes money, manages his money, buys food, manages his food, uh, may become prosperous through his hard work. But a fool doesn't do any of those things. A fool has a range of someone who's basically described as doesn't have a brain. He doesn't use his brain in the sense that he don't even have a brain. He's so uh, ignorant. He makes such dumb decisions. Okay, he's the type of person who uh, you say, don't go near that fire. He'll go near it. And he'll burn himself. He's, oh, that's hot. And you'll look back and say, well, no kidding. Why'd you do that? Well, I, I just 
want to see what it, if it's hot or not. Well, I told you, you see. So fools can be just uh, opposite. So the idea is, how does he get food? He doesn't like to work. He's too lazy. Does he steal it? He might. But notice, the opposite here is he becomes satisfied with food. In other words, he somehow figures out how to get enough food. Now, one of the things you want to be careful about is helping a fool. If a fool doesn't want wisdom, if he doesn't want knowledge, if he doesn't want to learn, then he will have to suffer for his mistakes. And there will be a lot of them. Now, you may show compassion now and then and say, well, he doesn't know how to work. Uh, I'll give him something to eat. But if you keep doing that, he'll never learn how to eat. You see? If you keep providing him housing, he'll never work and get a nice house for himself. I have some young daughters right now who are struggling to make enough money to buy a car. And the insurance has went sky high. And it's very expensive to own a car, even if it's an old used car. Uh, so they're struggling. And they realize, though, they have to work. I'll help them if I can. But they still understand the value of work. And if you want a car, you just can't go spend your money on whatever else you want. You have to save and shop and maybe wait a couple of years. But a fool, well, not quick enough. He don't want to work. So he depends on other people. He's got to have public transportation. He's got to have people giving him rides. He's got to have people giving him food. And what's so opposite here is that he has enough food to eat. And that's not normal. Only a corrupt society would provide for fools. Listen to this. A society that's backwards would take care of their fools. No. Fools need to get wise. If they don't want to work, they don't eat. If they don't want to deserve through their own jobs or being trained, they don't get good housing. Why should people who work hard finally get the house they've been wanting after 20 years of hard work have to pay for someone who doesn't want to work, have to pay for their housing? That's not right. So that's the idea behind this. A fool becomes satisfied with food. The next one, under a hated woman when she gets a husband. Now, a hated woman is hated by everybody. Hated by men, hated by women, hated by society. Uh, no one likes her. And there's good reason for that, doesn't tell us. But she's considered everybody's enemy. So who in the world would want to marry her? That's the idea. That's against the natural order. Men would want to love the woman. Or at least tolerate them. Right? Right? But we don't even have that here. She's hated. She's an enemy. Why would a man marry an, en marry an enemy? Some of your translations will use the word unloved. I don't think that's a good translation. The word means hate. Now you say, well, unloved could mean hate. It could, but not always. Just that they're not loved is kind of a neutral. There's no neutral here. She's hated. Naturally, no man would want to marry a woman who... Everyone hates. He doesn't even like her. That's against the natural order of things. Think of it. A hated woman would run a marriage, a household. Uh, if she gets in charge of something, like a household or a powerful household, uh, she would not help society any. She would do things that weren't right and be negative, have a big negative influence on society. The next one, a backwards one, and a maid servant when she dispossesses her mistress. Now, this is this woman who's a servant. She's a maid. She serves 
the mistress of the house. In other words, she serves the woman of the house. You have the man who might be called the master, the woman, the mistress. Okay, they both ru rule a household. A maid servant works for them. Well, somehow the maid servant gets the position of the mistress. So the mistress is out. Uh, she somehow got her away from her husband, and her husband decided that he doesn't want his wife anymore, and the maidservant comes in and takes her place. Well, that's backwards. That's wrong. She takes the place of her mistress for whatever reason. It goes back to like the slave who becomes a king. That's not right. So it's not her place. And all she's going to do is destroy the household because she doesn't know how to rule a household. What does she do with the children? How does she manage? Uh, maybe she's in charge of making sure the house has everything it needs. Uh, all the household things, any cleaning materials. Uh, well, things for the bathroom, right? Toothbrushes, soaps, towels, clothes for the kids, whatever. And the maidservant doesn't know how to do that. So this is all fouled up. It's wrong. And apparently she's found a way to gain the husband's loyalty. Maybe she did that in a bad way. Maybe there was adultery. Okay? It doesn't tell us. But the point is, she's out of place, and this is backwards. And this teaches us something, kind of a big picture. There's a natural way about things, okay? And if we have an understanding of how the moral order works, what's right and what's wrong, we'll see these things and we learn from them. And that's another lesson today. Well, we'll stop there and continue here next time with verse 24. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word, your wisdom. Uh, interesting ones today make us really think, help us understand that you do have a way that things are supposed to work on this earth and that we will follow them and strive to keep them for not only ourselves but for our families for society, for those we love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.